is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to talk about the fact that the real God, the God of the Bible, not a fictitious God, not a false God, not an idol, but the only true God, Jesus Christ, the biblical God, he desires to have a personal, intimate, living relationship with you and every human being alive. Now, that sentence there, where we describe who God is, according to the Bible, makes the biblical God completely different, completely unique from all the other gods or so-called goddesses. The, The biblical God is so different, so unique, there's not even a remote comparison. It's as if all the other gods and goddesses or ideas about God They are all um, human ideas projected out there. Only the biblical God, he contains such an enormous amount of truth, which is reflected in his word. But the complexity and yet the simplicity of who he is simultaneously is so far beyond anything that a ordinary man or an ordinary woman could have possibly made up. It's just beyond the ability of any human being to have invented, from a human perspective, the biblical God. Yet that's what he's always accused of being. Uh, Humanists and others accuse those who believe in the biblical God of, you know, making up a fairy tale or a mythology or a story. And yet, when you read the Bible, it has no none of the earmarkings. It has none, none of the signatures that are usually associated with your typical man-made story. This story is not man-made. That's why it's different, completely different than the other gods. And so that's extremely important. The other thing is, is that without exception, all the other gods... Um, because they're human-invented gods, have a very low priority concerning a one-to-one relationship with the men and women they created. Without exception, if you survey the gods of Greece and Rome, or you go back to Semiramis and Nimrod, or all the other false gods in human history, and there's thousands of them, you'll see that a conspicuous characteristic of all of these gods, which are false gods, is that they don't have any regard or very little regard for cultivating a a relationship between themselves and the beings, human beings, that they've created. Now, this is remarkable. Because it reveals the truth that that it's only the biblical God is the true God. You see, the biblical story, unlike all the other spiritual stories, is not it's not a convenient story. It doesn't fit into the parameters or a box that a man or a woman would invent. The whole story is so complicated. It's so contradictory to the kinds of books that human beings would write, especially if they were going to invent a mythology or a fairy tale or whatever. The the Bible is so incredibly complex, yet incredibly simple, and it doesn't fit within the parameters of human thinking. Because if human thinking was going to produce a god, human thinking will inevitably produce a god that in human thinking, is like a superhuman, or like a supercomputer, or whatever. And you see, when you look at the biblical God, he is devoid of all those giveaway clues that kind of let you know um, he is not a real God, he was just invented by men and women. The biblical God defies that dismissal. The biblical God defies <clears throat> that um, human attempt to confine him. And that's why, again, the biblical God is the only true God. And the the account of the biblical God that he gives us in the Bible is completely different than any other spiritual account. 
it, it teaches a completely different uh, spiritual approach. It, it, it teaches a completely different pathway to life. All the other religions, they kind of uh, synchronize. They kind of uh, say the same story in different ways. They all suggest falsely that man is going to become God through some kind of system of self-perfection or ritual. And whether it's going through a million reincarnations or whatever it is, the emphasis in every other religious system, whether it's New Age or witchcraft or the occult or whatever it is, the emphasis is always on some kind of, quote, spiritual program that you have to undertake or participate in for you to reach godhood, which is just a fancy way of saying for you to become God. Now, that, that's universally consistent with just about every religion ever made. Yet, in complete and utter contradiction to all of that, you have the biblical God who basically says in his word, it is impossible, it is totally impossible for a man or a woman to become God or to become like God. It is completely impossible. In a sense, God is saying, give up. You can't do it. It's impossible. And you only deceive yourself if you think you're going to arrive at Godhood. So you see, the Bible gives a completely contradictory message to all the other religions and to humanism and current scientific thought. It's a complete reversal. And the reason it's a complete reversal is that all the other religions were made up by men or women. Christianity, Judeo-Christian thinking, is the only religion that's not convenient. It's the only religion that doesn't fit into the human created program that the others do. And that proves, by the way, that's one of the proofs that it's authentic. Uh, It's one of the proofs that that is real. So we're going to delve into this. I think it's very important. I think it will answer many of your questions, and I think it will answer the questions that people you know have about God. Because God reveals himself in his word. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. You can pass this program on to somebody who needs to hear it. And you can go to paulmcguire.us or whatever social media platform you're using to listen to the program. And you can send a link with a personal note from you to somebody or a group or a friend or whatever that needs to hear this truth. And then again, a reminder. Uh, Tomorrow, June 26, 2019, we have a Paradise Mountain Church meeting. The meeting's free, parking's free. It begins at 6 p.m. sharp at the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City. But you have to pre-register, and you can do that at paulmcguire.us. I'm Paul Paul McGuire. We'll be back in just a second. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. One of the things I want to emphasize on today's program is something that continually needs to be reinforced and presented over and over again. Now, in my hand, I'm holding a Bible. This happens to be a black leather Bible with gold print. It doesn't make it any more special than uh, a non-leather Bible. A student of mine... uh, when I was teaching Bible prophecy, and I was also teaching uh, emotional healing and uh, a number of other courses at the King's College and Seminary as a professor. And uh, my students noticed that uh, I should have been using uh, reading glasses, so they gave me um, a black leather, gold uh, lettering Bible with the words of Jesus in red but with a slightly larger typeset, so it makes, makes it easy for me. And uh, <clears throat> in this book, the one thing that becomes very clear, just, just picking it up casually and reading it. In fact, I remember when Christians who had been witnessing to me at the University of Missouri, they gave me a Bible. They probably gave me a bunch of Bibles. 
In any case, I remember going home from the University of Missouri to New York City, and uh, certain truths were pounded into my head. And by that, I'm, I'm eternally thankful that certain truths were pounded into my head. One was from a very effective uh, ministry organization called Campus Crusade for Christ that was headed up by Dr. Bill Bright, who has since gone on to be with the Lord. And not only did I have the privilege of being discipled by members of Campus Crusade for Christ, but I had the privilege of working uh, very closely, one-on-one with Dr. Bill Bright, uh, again, by totally by God's grace, because the pastor, Paul Moore, a great man of God, one of my spiritual fathers, um, Paul Moore um, was uh, the head of the Lambs Club, and that was the Born Again nightclub on Times Square in New York, 44th Street and Broadway. And what it was, it was an when I say an old actors club that doesn't do it justice, it was an historic landmark. Uh, I don't know when it was built. I'm going to guess the 20s or something. And it was beautifully done <clears throat> and very famous, big time famous, you know, black and white Hollywood movie stars stayed there. It had a incredible theater for plays. It had a gigantic ballroom for, uh, you know, banquet, very, very classy banquet uh, dinners. It was located right in the heart heart of the Broadway Theater District. And yet, um, I remember, because in most ministries that I've been involved in, including the current one, Paradise Mountain Church and Paul McGuire Ministries, you know, people have this imaginary idea of what you do. Um, And let me just, let me just dispel any myths. (laughs) <laughs> and many of you do the same thing. It's like you do everything. So yes, I'm I'm the uh, person who speaks, the voice that people hear, the face that people hear. I, I speak at conferences on national television, et cetera, et cetera. My name is on the books. But what people don't see is that I do a lot of the grunt work and have, and I, I have since the beginning of my ministry. And You know, every day I'm packed with responsibilities. But see, I think it's important. I'm not. I'm not telling you this to brag in a stealth manner. I'm telling you this to to kind of give you a more vivid picture of what ministry is about, or what ministry should be about, and what um, this ministry is about. And that is the minister. In in this case, it's me, my wife. Is, is a partner with me, and we have key people in the ministry who who do different things that are very very important. And um, the key thing I want to stress, though, is that whenever you become a minister, and everyone is a minister, I was in the quote ministry for decades and decades and decades before it was quote some kind of official thing. I just supported my ministry in business as a film producer and different corporate corporate jobs and stuff, just like the rest of you. I supported my ministry uh, with a full-time vocational career. And I personally think that somebody who wants to be in the ministry and is not willing to work in the real world, I think that should be a mandatory requirement for anyone who wants to be in the ministry, male or female. Because I can tell you this from my own observation. When a minister gets up there to preach, again, I'm not here to knock people, but when a minister gets up there to preach, I can usually tell by the end of the sermon, depending upon what topic he's talking about, I can usually tell, and believe me, so can his congregation and visitors. They may be polite. I can usually tell if that particular minister has always worked, quote, in the the shielded world of the ministry, or or has already already had these kind of like cush Christian jobs. I can tell that immediately, versus the guy or the girl who had to work in real jobs, no family name to promote you. You had to start off from scratch, and you had to go through the jungle, so to speak. I don't believe you have much to say to people that you're ministering to if you have not walked in their shoes. 
if you've never held a real job with a real boss that may be angry and demanding, with real pressures, with politics, whether it's at the office or it's in a a carpet cleaning company or a plumbing company or whatever, there's politics, there's egos, there's stresses. Now, and then sales jobs in specific, you know, your income is, is reliant on commission. Well, if the minister is getting up there preaching to me, he cannot and she cannot minister to me very effectively if they've never been, let's just call it, in the hot seat. So I've been in the hot seat because I've spent decades working in many different professions, beginning as a young boy. Like I said, I started working at 15 years old or 14 years old, like many of you did, because that back then, in terms of generations, that's just what people did. And so I've worked for decades in the real world. I've had real bosses that are difficult to get along with. I've had to deal with office politics and everything else. I did not live a sheltered Christian life. And therefore, when I get up and speak and minister to people, um, especially about job, money, income, getting along with people, man, man I've, I've lived through it. I'm not giving you a theoretical spiritual idea of what it's like. I've been through the war zone like you have. And I can pick up relatively quickly, again, probably like you can, whether or not a particular minister, and this minister could be very famous, it means nothing to me really. Um, if they've never held down a real job, doesn't mean God can't use them in the ministry. He does use them in the ministry. But their message, their biblical message, their message for Jesus on how to be a victorious Christian in the real world, in the real world of nine to five or whatever, it's going to be a shallow message. And I've heard many, many shallow messages. Again, I'm not criticizing the individual. I've heard many, many shallow messages for one thing. The person giving the message got their ministry job, usually because of a relative or a father or something. Doors were open for them, et cetera, et cetera. So they have no idea what it's like to scramble for a living and the pressures that are involved. Therefore, uh, again, it doesn't mean God doesn't love them. It doesn't mean that God can't use them. He does. But it's been my observation that their ministry and the power of their ministry is limited and, and very shallow in the areas of jobs, employment office politics, all the rest of it. And, and those of you that have held real jobs, which is probably most of you, know exactly what, what, what I mean. And uh, again, I'm not picking on anybody, but I've noticed too many, let's just call them really soft sermons that sound great, but they sound as if they were created by someone who was sitting in an air-conditioned office trying to theoretically imagine what it might be like to go to work in a nine-to-five job that, that nobody likes. You know, if you haven't been there, man, your message is hollow. So I think for anybody who's, who desires to go into the ministry, one of the prerequisites should be that that individual spends probably at least five years, at least five years. You can, you can be in the full-time ministry, as I was, and be full-time employed. But you spend at least five years in, in, in tough businesses, not just um, beginning businesses, but you get promoted. You work hard. You have some accountability. Then you have something to say. Because I hear pastors get up there all the time, and they, and they speak so squeaky clean, and they act so Christian, you know. Hey, that, that, that may fly uh, in the church job with the church staff. But you you talk like that that phony stuff in the in the real world, and you, you you all of you who've had real jobs know what I'm talking about. You got a boss or coworkers that are cursing up a storm. So I mean, if you're going to blush because somebody says something that's a swear word, but in the scope of things, it's rather minor. You have nothing to say. Again, this is not for the purpose of picking on people. But if you cannot connect to the real world, if you cannot communicate to the real world. If you don't know how to relate to people in the real world, then you aren't properly trained. You're not equipped to be a real minister. And you need to take a, a leave of absence and work your you-know-what off.
And I'm extremely serious about that. I think people who try to minister without working in real secular jobs don't have much to say uh, because they're out of touch. Okay, now, that's, that's a tough, um, wasn't that tough, let's be honest, it wasn't that tough, just honest. Um, but the other thing is, is that the Lord supernaturally equips us. We have, the, we have the privilege of walking in the Lord, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, and going into all the world and preaching the gospel. If we renew our minds with the Word of God, and by the way, if you're renewing your mind with the Word of God, which means you're reading the Word of God, you're meditating on it, and you're applying, it requires mental exercise. There's no shortcut. If you're applying the Word of God to life and circumstances, it's going to always require some mental stretching and some mental effort. That's how you develop wisdom. That's how you become a wise man or a wise woman. People in the world will respect you if they perceive you to be a woman or a man of knowledge and wisdom. People in the world, you'll find that doors are closed. They'll be closed right in your face. If you attempt to minister to people, and if you attempt to share the gospel to people, without first earning their respect in the workplace or the business place, it's going to boomerang on you. Because the first thing they're going to say is, why should I listen to this idiot? That They may not say idiot, but they're thinking that. Because this person can't get to work on time. Their work product is horrible. We're all covering for them because they do such a sloppy job, it's such a lousy job. They're always blabbing about Jesus but they won't answer the phones or whatever else they're hired to do. Let me tell you something. Because you've acted with such a lack of wisdom, the best thing you can do is shut your mouth and, and do your job right. And after you've produced, no, not do your job right for 60 seconds, do your job right for like six months to a year. Be one of the best employees because you're doing the job. Then you earn the right. Then people will respect you. Then doors will open up. But I can't tell you how many times I've been in the business world and some newly hired fool gets hired. And I don't apologize for the word fool. They are fools. And they're blabbing about the Lord and they're doing this and they're doing that. But they're also sleeping with their boyfriend. They're sleeping with their girlfriend. They're, they're, they, they're lazy. They don't, they don't do their job right. They don't fill out forms properly. They don't, they're not accountable. Nobody listens to that person. It would be better if they shut up. So I'm, I'm a real stickler on this because the vast, overwhelming majority of my life I have financed, and up until this moment, up until this moment, I finance to a large degree, if not 100%, uh, uh, the ministry with my own personal monies. I've done that my entire lifetime. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, I've always had employment uh, in different areas where I can generate money. Now, in this ministry, I don't keep the money. I, I happen to have a employment in, in areas like uh, book writing, etc., uh, and other media areas. Well, I don't keep, Paul McGuire doesn't keep that money. That money, I might have every right to keep, but. That money from the books and stuff goes directly into Paradise Mountain Church. So in other words, through my own efforts and work, because I work about 18 hours a day, through my own efforts and work, I, I uh, um, give the money that, that I'm totally entitled to keep into the ministry so that the ministry can expand as far as God wants it to. And I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. and convey to you how wonderful I am. That's not, that's not my purpose. My purpose is just to say when I say stuff on the radio like, go to the Lord and ask the Lord how much you should give uh, to this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, and then don't make up your mind about how much you're going to give before you talk to the Lord. Let the Lord speak to you, and then whatever the Lord tells you to do, you simply obey the Lord. That's very important. 
because I live under a slightly different principle than I see most Christians do. Again, not because I'm better, and I really want to emphasize this, not because I'm better, but a lot of people are, are somewhat legalistic with the Lord. But you know what? If that's what God told you to do, then do not let me interfere. If God has told you to do something in, in a particular way, and your conscience uh, is clean, and you feel you're obeying the Lord, then never allow somebody like me or anybody else, just because the Lord may be dealing with me differently, you do what the Lord told you to do. You give the way the Lord tells you to give. And, and don't allow me or anybody else to change what you know to be true, what God has told you. Um, but, the, but the point I'm trying to make is that um, the, uh, the Lord has revealed to me what I consider a very powerful, overarching principle. Now, the Lord may have revealed the same principle to you, or he may have revealed other principles. The point is, we obey what, what the Lord has told us to do, okay, each one of us. The one thing the Lord told me is, Paul, this is for me. I'm not trying to say you have to do exactly what I'm doing. But I felt the Lord tell me, because I was asking the Lord about giving and donations and contributions. And since the Lord knows everything, you know, I don't lie to the Lord because it would be ridiculous. He can see right through me. But I was trying to get guidance from the Lord as to what to do. And basically, and it's not because I'm a great super spiritual person, but it's because of the nature of my life and the nature of my ministry. I give everything, everything to the Lord, absolutely everything. Because my work, and not everybody has this privilege, by the way, so I'm not trying to cop a subtle higher ranking of spirituality. But I'm in a position where what I write, what I speak on, what I do, the radio program, it's all the same. It's all uh, for the ministry that the Lord has called me to, called me to do. So I'm giving the Lord 100% of my life. And therefore, my time, my energy, my money, not my money anyway, Money I get is the Lord's money. Money that comes in from you, uh, the listener, through donations, through electronic donations or checks or whatever, that is certainly not my money. That's God's money and goes right into Paradise Mountain Church. As I, I, not, I don't touch that money. I'm talking about monies that I generate. So it's all I give 100% to the Lord. Um, now, that doesn't mean I don't keep um, certain things that the Lord allows me to keep, like to eat food and stuff, and, and pay the mortgage and stuff. But what it means is that um, my commitment, again, not because I'm so spiritual, but just the, the way it worked out, my commitment is 100%. And therefore, I trust the Lord 100% to meet my needs. Uh, but I'm not doing it, this is what I, I didn't, didn't explain this the clearest way, but what the emphasis I want to make here that I think will set a lot of people free from bondage, and there's, there's a balance here between bond, the bondage of legalism and the grace of the Lord in terms of God's instruction to us, uh, whether it's done out of legalism or the truth of God's word. And the bottom line is that um, if you're giving God everything, your energy, your, your time, et cetera, et cetera, then that's between you and God. Not everybody can do that. It would be a horrible burden. But you see, because I've given God everything, first and foremost, in the area of my mind, my heart, uh, my dreams, my visions, that, that's more important than anything. And since I've given God everything, I expect God to, to meet the needs of the ministry to meet my needs, to protect, to supply. Since I've given God my all, I expect God to give me his all. And I'm just trying to bring you there, not for the purpose of manipulation. Please let me underscore that. Not for the purpose of manipulation. For the purpose of there's a higher level of walking with the Lord. And the higher level with the Lord is that when you give God everything, when Jesus Christ truly becomes Lord of your life, you're giving God everything. Everything you do 
is is hopefully intended to fulfill his plan. Okay, so when that happens to you, you can certainly ask God to bless you and to provide for you accordingly, because everything you do is for the Lord. Now that doesn't that doesn't let's not get carried off into insane extremes. That doesn't mean every time I watch television, it's for the Lord. It doesn't mean every time. Uh, you know, I take a break. It's for the Lord. I'm just talking about the general, not the general, my reason for living besides being a father and a husband and a minister is to move this ministry forward to accomplish certain goals. And so I believe I'm being led by the Lord to occupy the land until he comes. And so I teach others to do the same thing. But what I'm trying to say is that when that becomes your purpose, when, when the purposes of God become your purposes, when your very heartbeat reflects God's heartbeat, you get out of this fractional percentage thing, okay? Nothing wrong with that. If that's what the Lord's telling you to do, then do what the Lord's telling you to do. But you get out of this fractional percentage thing. You're giving God everything, and you're, you're, you're not better than anybody. You're just moving in a different according to a different game plan. Okay, so, um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is it frees you up. You should not come away from what I just said with any sense of legalism. Okay, you should not come away with this excessive fear and paranoia. Gee, am I giving everything to the Lord and torture yourself? If that's the message you're getting, then you're getting the wrong message. The message is not a message of legalism. The message is a message of, of unmerited favor, and it should set you free. Religion is the counterfeit of a supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, so what we learn from the Lord, um, when the Lord went up to heaven, he was with his disciples in the book of Acts. You remember the story. And he was giving them, you know, his final assignment before he went up to heaven. And when he went up to heaven, the angel said to, this, to the disciples, they reminded him, this same Jesus who you see going into heaven now will return in a, in a likewise or similar manner. So at some point in our lives, or after we die or whatever, Jesus Christ is going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. He's going to return to earth with the armies of heaven. Our job is to preach the gospel to occupy the land until he comes. That's our job, to be faithful. And the Lord, in his goodness, does not give us this, this assignment and then make us powerless. He gives us the assignment, and then on top of giving us whatever assignments he gives us, he gives us the supernatural authority, the supernatural power to do it. Now, this should really set you free. If you have any yokes of bondage or guilt or you're beating yourself up or you feel like you're failing or whatever, you should be set free by this incredible truth, the truth of God's Word, which is um, the assignment that God has given you. That assignment, He knows you cannot fulfill that assignment on your own strength, wisdom, or ability. You can only fulfill the divine assignment that God's given you through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is not your, your power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit? How do you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, you don't do it through willpower. You don't do it by you know, burning yourself out and thinking, well, you can do it if you could just concentrate uh, hard enough. No. The Christian life, the secret of the Christian life is from faith to faith. So just like you got saved by faith, you couldn't make yourself born again except by faith. So too, um, you put your faith in God, and to the degree that you put your faith in God, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Holy Spirit will enable you to accomplish things that you could never do on your own 
wisdom, strength, or power. So God gives you faith. That means you turn the weight over it of it to him, and you trust him to do it. And then, here's the most incredible thing of all. God gives you the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not you accomplishing the ministry. It's not you being an effective witness for Christ. It's ultimately not you that's victorious in the various spiritual battles you you face. It's Jesus in you. Greater is he than is in you than he that is in the world. And when you walk in that, you're set free in an incredible, incredible way. Now, let me read you something from the Gospel of John, and I believe this will set you free. Because the burden should not be on you and your human personality. The burden should be on Jesus, because Jesus is God. He can carry the weight. You can't carry the weight. I can't carry the weight. So in John chapter 14, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, the way you know. Sounds a little awkward, but you get the point. Um, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Obviously, Thomas was not paying attention. (laughs) Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father also. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe for the sake of the words themselves. So what Jesus Christ is telling um, the disciple here, he's giving, giving him a reminder. He's giving Philip a reminder of a truth that he already taught him. If you have seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Because the biblical God is the triune God. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you invite Christ into your life to make you born again, Christ comes into your life to make you born again through the Holy Spirit. It's the same God, but it's God expresses himself in three different ways. The triune God, the Trinity. That's an important biblical doctrine. It is spiritual era to reject the doctrine of the Trinity, by the way, because it begins, the doctrine of the Trinity begins in the book of Genesis, where we read the words, let let us make man in our own image. In the image of God, he made them, uh, both male and female. Well, who's us? Is God schizophrenic? Let us make man in our own image? No, he, he meant let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, make man in our own image. So we're made in the image of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's an important but very simple truth. And you don't have to overcomplicate it. It's like water. Water can be liquid. Water can be steam if you heat it up. Water can be like an ice cube if you freeze it. It's still water. All right. Now, look what Jesus says in verse 11, 1411. Well, no, I want to start back in Jesus 1410. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. This is a very important, powerful truth. When you um, get a revelation of this truth, of the importance of authority, and when that becomes a rhema truth to you, 
and you really own that truth, that will enable you to release enormous spiritual power in your life and, in, and through your life. Because you will recognize that you do the supernatural, you do the miracles of God, not because of any human or fleshly authority that you possess. You are able to do the miraculous because your authority comes directly from Christ, and Christ's authority comes directly from the Father. Now, what we need to understand and never forget is that the Father is God the Father. God the Father is Almighty God. He's the supreme being. There is no greater power in all the cosmos, in, in any universe. God is the final and highest authority above anything that is alive or anything that's dead. There is nothing higher than God and his authority. In, ad- in addition, we need to recognize who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is, in terms of his authority, King of kings and Lord of lords. So. Jesus serves God the Father. There's no higher authority than him in the entire universe. We serve Jesus, who's King of kings and Lord of lords. Therefore, it's very, very important for us to fully grasp the truth of authority, because the truth of authority will lead to a revelation of the power, the authority, and the level of the miraculous that you can release in your life. I hope you heard that. It all has to do with authority. So let's start out with the basics. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So in all the created world, all the created universe, uh, in contrast to all the earthly governments, kings, queens, emperors, empresses, presidents, prime ministers, whatever somebody's earthly authority is, The reality is, and we're to be in submission to earthly authorities, by the way, but the reality is, is that in addition to the earthly authorities, there is the authority of Jesus Christ and God the Father. And the authority of Jesus Christ is way, way above any earthly authority. That's why it says Jesus Christ is King of Kings. There is no king greater. There's no king with more authority than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. There may be many lords on the earth. It's a title, you know, like lord so-and-so or whatever. But Jesus Christ is the lord of lords and king of kings. That means among earthly governments. It means among spiritual governments, Luciferian governments, whatever these governments may be. The truth is there is no authority in heaven or on earth, that is more powerful than the authority of Jesus Christ. So if you were going to appeal, for example, to the law, if you were going to appeal to a courtroom, you have to remember that the authority of Jesus Christ triumphs every other kind of authority. And so when you operate your life, not based on your own authority, but when you operate your life and ministry with faith in the ultimate authority of Jesus Christ, by faith, that authority of Jesus Christ is conveyed upon you. That doesn't mean you become the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but it means that you, Jesus has given you the legal right to use his authority. That's why you never have to be afraid of the demonic realm, principalities and powers, the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. When you're involved in spiritual battle, And that can take the form of prayer. It can take the form of casting out demons. It can take many forms. You never have to be afraid of a a boasting demonic spirit. And by the way, demonic spirits love to boast. You never have to fear a demonic spirit because the authority in you is vastly superior than any authority that demonic spirit has. So Jesus says, I do not speak on my own authority. So what gave Jesus the power? He wasn't speaking from his own authority. He was speaking from the Father's authority who dwells in him. 
Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. So we believe that, right? Yes, we do. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. What he meant by that is to his disciples and and people who read the Bible, we have read the accounts of Jesus' many miracles. The people alive and the disciples saw firsthand Jesus Christ's many miracles. Jesus Christ performed miracles that no human being has the power to do. Opening blind eyes, casting out demons, healing the sick. Uh, one miracle after another miracle Jesus did. Why was, able, Jesus, why was Jesus able to do all these ma- miracles, by, but by which no man could do, by the way? This was unprecedented. Because he wasn't operating on his own authority. He was operating on the authority of God the Father. So when you and I, yeah, we feel insignificant as people. We don't feel like we're any big deal. Okay? and But see, this is a critical point. Right here is is one of the most critical points in the message that I'm sharing with you today. And you should take out your cell phone or a notepad and a pen and and write down a couple of notes to jar your memory. What What I'm about to share with you now is one of the most critical points of today's entire program and message. And I want to read it to you. If you get, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would give your people a revelation of what it means to be operating in your authority. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would give me an ongoing revelation of what it means to operate in the authority of Jesus Christ, Lord. Open that door for us so that we can fulfill your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so Jesus continues. Most assuredly, I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. So what does this mean? It means that Jesus Christ has supernaturally given us his authority, just like God the Father supernaturally gave Jesus his authority. Jesus Christ has supernaturally given us his authority. And remember, he has the authority of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's pretty heavy-duty authority. So that means, let's go back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, before the fall of mankind, before they listened to Lucifer and ate from the tree in the middle of the garden, Adam and Eve were given the supernatural authority by God to rule and reign on planet Earth and to rule and reign in the Garden of Eden. They were, in effect, the kings and queens of earth and the Garden of Eden. That doesn't mean they were God. They served under the true God. They were the creatures, small c, under the Creator, capital C. But how they were able to manage the the planet, how they were able to manage the Garden of Eden, is God conferred upon them supernatural power and authority. And the only thing that could unplug that supernatural power and authority was if they were to disobey God's words, specifically if they were to eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Okay, so they had everything, but they chose to disobey God's word. They rejected God's word, and that short-circuited all the supernatural power that God was flooding into their lives. The second they listened to the, 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 uh, the serpent and they ate of the tree, they rejected the word of God. That brought about a curse, and they lost, at that nanosecond, they lost their supernatural power and authority. In fact, it was so bad, they lost the supernatural power and authority in their inner beings uh, that gave them the capacity to live eternal life at a perfect age and never get sick. That's how serious it was. It was called the fall of man. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in this serious way, 
Lucifer, who tempted them to sin, he orchestrated this. He then became legally the temporary God of this world, and he performs counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. But on top of it, when he took the supernatural authority that Adam and Eve had, uh, he made Adam and Eve and all the physical descendants of Adam and Eve captives or slaves in his Luciferian world system. Most Bible teachers don't teach on this anymore, but it's the Bible. Most churches don't teach on this anymore, but it's the Bible. And they're doing you, the believer, a terrible disservice if they're not teaching the entire Word of God. Because right now, what I'm sharing with you is mandatory for a Bible teacher and somebody who calls himself a pastor or a minister to share with you. It's mandatory. What am I talking about? I am focusing in on a very important subject matter for God's people. I'm going to, going to, in a moment, based on what God's Word says to you and me, I'm going to hand you back the keys of the kingdom that you lost when Adam and Eve fell. And when you recognize that Jesus Christ, in his Word, has restored to you the keys of the kingdom, the revel, if you're open to it and you study the Word of God, the revelation of the Holy Spirit will impart to you a supernatural understanding that your spiritual authority, your spiritual dominion, your spiritual power has been restored and that you have the keys of the kingdom. And you can use them just as certainly as Adam and Eve used them. And that is what Listen, this is it, man. This is, this is a make-or-break situation. We talk about all the things that we should be doing as believers in Christ, like occupying the land, going to all the world and preaching the gospel, making disciples of all nations. All these things are critically important. But none of them, none of them can be done without receiving power from on high, the dunamis power of God. None of them can be done without receiving the supernatural anointing and authority that Christ gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we get back the actual supernatural power and authority that Adam and Eve got when we repent of our unbelief and sins and simply by faith reach out our hands and receive what God is trying to give us. What is God trying to give us? Jesus Christ is reaching out right now in the invisible realm. Jesus Christ is reaching out to you right now in the invisible realm. And he's handing you, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you can see it, that your eyes would not be blind, but they could see clearly. Jesus Christ is standing right before you right now in the spiritual world, and he's holding up to you in his hand the keys of the kingdom. And he's saying he wants you, by faith, to receive the keys of the kingdom. If you will, by faith, simply reach out and receive the keys of the kingdom, then Jesus Christ is returning to you now the supernatural authority that Adam and Eve had before they blew it and initiated the fall of mankind. You have the power to bind and loose. So, I want you to do this. You don't have to have a vision. If you have a real one, that's fine. But learn how to mature yourself in the Lord so you can discern the difference between inspired imaginations or visions. But you know what? That's not the issue. The issue is that if you receive the supernatural authority, the keys of the kingdom that Christ wants to restore to you right now, it's then at that exact nanosecond that you are filled with power from on high, the dunamis, and you can go about your father's business. You can win people to Christ supernaturally. You can make disciples of all nations supernaturally. You can pray and God will answer miraculously. And you can exercise the dominion or authority, the rulership or the reignership. Or, or you can rule and reign with Christ here on earth and heavenly places starting now. Now, the devil hates this truth, so he will do anything he can 
to oppose it, to oppose it, to unseat it from your mind. But remember, the reason you you may experience a spiritual attack in the area of your mind regarding this powerful truth is this: God want, I mean, the devil wants God's people powerless. And what the devil may do is say, well, look at all the nuts and the wackos who believe they have the power of God. Look at all the phony healing evangelists. Look at all the phony this and all the phony that. Okay, all that phony stuff is there. It's called reality. We don't deny it. We don't deny that. All that phony stuff is there, and it put the body of Christ into to great discredit. But just because Reverend Billy Bob... Um, and all the others went off the deep end, acted like crazy idiots, and and uh, made the body of Christ a shame. Doesn't mean you have to do. Doesn't mean I have to. The restoration of God in the last days, the power of the Holy Spirit being restored in the last days. God is going to raise up a generation that's not going to act like fools whenever they minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, what does God tell us in His Word? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. Greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Now, most Christians instantaneously, and, and you know, they, they're doing it out of a heart of faith. They're jumping up and down and saying, I'm going to do greater works. Okay, I'm not going to d- diminish what God's Word says. God's Word says you will do greater works. But here's a piece of advice. It's not an unbelief. It's called advice. Be open to God doing greater works in and through you. God promises that he will in the last days. That may happen in the future. However, as a matter of caution, and not unbelief, but caution, I would say to you, be cautious because a lot of people are running around in the flesh trying to do the greater works, greater works than Jesus. And it's not happening, so they're trying to make it up. Okay, so I hear some reports of counterfeit miracles, all kinds of counterfeit signs and wonders that really didn't happen. But somebody has gone off trying to believe God's word, which is a good thing, where it says, um, I'm, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. That's fine, but don't fake it. Don't manufacture it yourself. Allow the Lord to produce it, okay? Verse 13, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay, so here's the keys of the kingdom. You have the right, supernaturally, whatever you ask in my name, Jesus' name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So you have the power, the supernatural power, to transcend reality. And whatever you ask Jesus in his name, he will do it. That's called, you have now entered the miraculous. Verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Pretty simple. Whatever you ask Jesus in his name, he will do it. That means you can ask God for miracles. And then it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, that's the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. And in the day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, we're going to continue reading on um, about the Holy Spirit living inside you, and how important that is. Um, The other thing that we have to uh, uh, remember is... The key is to rightly divide the Word of God. So let's take this supernatural authority that, by, way, by the way, did not go away in the first century. I hate to break it to you. It's, it's, why would it go away in the first century? What kind of sense does that make? 
We are now in the time period of the greatest spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world, which is the title of my new book. We're in the most intense last days battle that ever will be or ever was. Why would God take away our supernatural authority in the time period where it's most needed? The answer is, he wouldn't. So, even though there are dispensations to to whatever degree in the Bible, it makes no sense whatsoever to say that God is going to remove from the church its supernatural power, its power to perform miracles, its power to exercise the authority in Jesus Christ. It makes no sense whatsoever to remove the supernatural power from God's people in the time period where the battle is the fiercest and we're fighting actual demonic powers. God doesn't do that. God wouldn't do that. In fact, it contradicts all the other scriptures. So, in, in, in due respect to my, my brothers who study the Word of God very profoundly, I would suggest that you've made a theological miscalculation. Because number one, why would God take away from his people, the church, the supernatural and authority they need to be victorious in the great last days battle? Why would God take away from his church and believers the power to ask God for miracles in the time period, the last days, when it's needed the most, and the spiritual warfare engagements with the demonic are at an unprecedented all-time high? The answer is he wouldn't do that. And on top of it, you're not reading the Bible in in its entirety. Because if you read the book of Joel, chapter 2, and if you read the book of Acts, chapter 2, you see clearly, I mean, I don't know how much clearer you want to see it, that God promises to pour out his Holy Spirit in the last days. So you do not have a biblical argument to stand on when you say that all of the miracles and all of the gifts went away in the first century. You know, it's great that you say that. I understand why people say that. Believe me, I have great sympathy. They say that because as they look around, I'm going to be very blunt, as they look around, they see a lot of charlatans, a lot of con men, a lot of fools saying they're raising dead people and they're not claiming to perform these incredible miracles and then they're not. They see a lot of con men, a lot of cheats, a lot of hypnotists, uh, faking and counterfeiting miracles, and so and so, they they're saying, well, these people aren't performing miracles; they're they're fakes. Well, they're they're right; those people aren't performing miracles. Many of them are fakes. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. A miracle of God never has to be faked. You got to fake a miracle of God. It's not a miracle of God. So I can understand their desire to clamp down, because there is a lot of nonsense out there. But again, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, I want to raise up a very important issue here. But first, I want to read Acts chapter 2, because this is, this is taken from Joel chapter 2, and it's what God says through the Holy Spirit about what's going to happen in the last days. Acts chapter 2 is is practically a word-for-word replication of Joel chapter 2. So Joel, the uh, Israeli Old Testament prophet, prophesies this. And um, um, Peter prophesies it. So let's read what the Word of God says regarding the gifts and the power of God among his people in the last days. Acts chapter 2, verse 13. Let's start at verse 15. Okay. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third day of the hour. So the the, the apostles and disciples were so ecstatic, they were so happy, they were so high, not on narcotics, but they were so joyous because of the supernatural power of God that indwelt them, that people mistook that for them being intoxicated on alcohol. So he wanted to make it clear that none of these apostles and disciples were drunk. But what was happening instead was a fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said. 
Now, it's important to pay attention to what the Word of God is actually saying, because if your argument is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit went away in the Old Testament, then why would the prophet Joel have given a prophecy about the miracle, the miraculous outpouring of... Why would the prophet Joel in the Old Testament have given a miraculous prophecy about a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was to occur in the last days in the New Testament? Okay, why would the prophet Joel have given a futuristic prophecy of the miraculous outpouring and gifts of the Holy Spirit that will happen in the last days in the New Testament if all the gifts went away uh, in the first century? Well, he wouldn't have. This is ongoing, okay? It's ongoing. You've got to read the text correctly. You can't just make stuff up and cut and paste it anywhere you want. So this is what Joel is saying. Peter's quoting Joel from the Old Testament. Verse 17, chapter 2, Acts. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out on my, of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through uh, through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So we see that God is performing all these incredible miracles. And we see them directly connected with the Holy Spirit. First of all, according to Joel, the, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes in the last days. The last days cannot possibly be construed as ending with the first century church. That makes no sense whatsoever. It's theologically irrational. The last days are the days, officially that began on the day of Pentecost, but the last days are all the days up until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's up until that point where God's Word says that miracles, signs, wonders, prophecies, interpretation of dreams, and all the rest of this miraculous stuff legitimately can happen. That's what the word says. You can't add just because you don't have, you have a problem because somebody acts like a nut who speaks in tongues. That's really your problem. I mean, I'm not encouraging that people act like nuts, but it's your problem because you're, you're adding into the scripture something that it doesn't say. So in the last days, we're in the last days, we're in the latter part of the last days. According to Joel, according to the book of Acts, all of the following is going to happen. End of story. This is what the Word of God says. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God. So we're in the last days, right? So legitimately, it's happening now. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. The Holy Spirit. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Let's underline that. Here is a miraculous sign and wonder, which God says is going to happen among his sons and daughters. They are going to prophesy supernaturally. doesn't matter whether you like it or whatever, anybody likes it. They're going to prophesy supernaturally. Now, the only thing I would add to that, I don't feel that, the, I believe the Bible makes a distinction between prophesying, let's say, in the New Testament sense, when people have the gift of prophesying or uh, discerning prophecy or whatever, and that is legitimate. There will be miraculous prophesying in the time period and the last days that we live in. But as for the office of a prophet, which is a supernatural office, all I can tell you is I believe that there are men and women who have uh, strong prophetic giftings. I simply have not seen um, 
a modern day Isaiah, Joel, Ezekiel, etc. And I'm not going to make it up and say I've seen it. I haven't seen it. I've seen nobody uh, that walks around with that level of supernatural integrity. Now, I'm not trying to disparage people that have strong prophetic giftings. And I'm not going to brag about myself and my own ministry. You can do your own math there. But the point is, I'm not saying God has not given people strong prophetic giftings. That's different than raising them up to the level of a Joel, Ezekiel, etc. But these, this is a miraculous sign that's going to happen in the church. Your young men shall see visions. And as you've heard me before, I, I, I claim to have one vision in my life. I could claim to have 50. But I'm not going to do that because I make a dis- I distinguish between what I call an inspired imagination and an authentic 100% vision from the Lord. And I think many people who claim to have visions, what they're really experiencing is um, is a uh, inspired imagination. So we have to be we have to discern. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, prophetic dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit, the Holy Spirit in those days. That means ever since the church was born, there was the outpouring on the day of Pentecost. But if you look at the history of the church, you will see that after the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there has been times and seasons throughout church history where the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, and you cannot attribute all of it to what some people like to quickly dismiss as a counterfeit revival. Sorry, folks, that doesn't fly. You can't call the First Great Awakening a counterfeit uh, revival. You can't call the Second Great Awakening a counterfeit revival. There are legitimate biblical revivals. God does pour out his spirit supernaturally and authentically. Now, having said that, you have to discern, because even though I said there are legitimate biblical revivals, there are also uh, counterfeit revivals and great apostasy, where you see signs and wonders, and the way you know it's a counterfeit revival is the people who are claiming to be the prophets and having the prophecies, they're saying things that are in contradiction to what the Word of God says. And if a prophet is saying things that are in contradiction to what the Word of God says, that person is a false teacher or a false prophet. So you have to be very discerning. That doesn't mean you, 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 you're, you're not open to revival. You're just not open to any foolish thing that comes down the pike in the name of revival. I know this is going to offend people, but I'm going to say it anyway. Or am I going to say it? I don't know. No, I'm going to say it. I meet people, and I'm not trying to. No, I'm going to say it. Uh, I meet people all the time who claim to have experienced gold dust. God could manifest anything he wants to. I am very suspicious, not suspicious, I don't believe the gold dust that people say they're experiencing is really there. I've spent a lifetime studying scientific mind control, brainwashing, hypnosis, suggestibility, and all kinds of things. What you're really talking about in the gold dust experiences is a kind of collective mass hypnotic state. Why would God um, sprinkle gold dust throughout a meeting or a congregation for the frivolous enjoyment of Christians, while there are people starving all over the world and in desperate need of food, where ministries and people and individuals are in desperate need of finances, why would the true God, the God of love, frivolously sprinkle dull gold dust in the air so a bunch of Christians can laugh without there being a systematic collection of the so-called gold dust, and then that gold dust, if it was being poured out in the amounts that people claim to have experienced, could be gathered and sold to feed the poor, clothe the naked, etc., etc. It does not ring true. It does not ring true because it's frivolous. 
I remember Pat Robertson taking on these two faith people. Pat Robertson believed in faith. Pat Robertson believed in miracles. But he chastised these two faith healers, correctly so, because they said they had a vision of people, of angels having a snowball fight in their yard. And Pat Robertson rebuked, he stood very toughly against this kind of nonsense, and he said, God Almighty doesn't entertain us by sending angels down to to frivolously have snowball fights in our yard. That is a fanciful human made-up story, because it's out of character with God. God's angels are precious. We're in the greatest spiritual war in the history of the world. God doesn't send angels down to earth to have a snowball fight among each other. In the same way, God doesn't send gold dust among God's people so they can just squander it. It would be collected and given to minister to the poor. You've got to learn the difference between mass hypnotic states and self-hypnosis and a genuine move of God. I know that will annoy some people, but, you know, I have to tell the truth. I have to tell the truth as a preacher of the Word of God. I've been around the block. I've seen no evidence whatsoever of gold dust. Sorry, sorry to break it to you. And if there was evidence, then it would be measured by a collection and sending it to feed the poor and hungry. We have to be aware of false teachers and false prophets in the last days. On top of that, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too far on this, but some of the prophecies I hear that people swear to, they all fit into the category of indulgent frivolous, and silly. Hey, I'm not a legalist. I believe God gives joy, supernatural joy, all kinds of things. But I I hear these prophecies continually from people who are bestowed the title of prophet that I don't think they're prophets at all. They've done nothing to even remotely establish that they're prophets. Their theological education, their study of the scripture is mediocre at best. They're either, I'm not going to judge why they're doing what they're doing, but their prophecies and their visions don't ring true. They're frivolous. They're silly. They're indulgent. And on top of that, they, they convey an enormous lack of creative med- imagination. In other words, they, 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 they claim to have gone to heaven, and what they see is so mediocre and so pathetic. And to me, what that reveals is that they invented the vision, not God. Because, see, the Word of God says, regarding the majesty, the glory, and the wonder of heaven, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard. God is saying that heaven is going to be so spectacular that our mere finite human brains are not going to be able to process the full majesty, glory, wonder, and beauty of heaven. It's going to be such a mind-blowing experience that it's going to be beyond our ability to imagine. So you have these people who claim to go to heaven, and they come back with these ridiculous, finite, sad sack stories of a really lame heaven. That's not God. Because the the imagination level is like, it's a flatliner. Enough said. Unfortunately, this is rampant in the Christian community. And it, it, the other thing is, when we are in the greatest spiritual battle, the hearts and souls of mankind in the history of the world, which we are, if you do your studying, you realize the stakes are, are so high, they're, 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 they're staggering. The danger to America is at such a high-level threat, we could see a toppling of our current form of government. We could see the installation of a totalitarian state. And these are things that people who study history are concurring. These are things that people that know what they're talking about in terms of history and uh, the, the dynamics of Marxist insurgencies, people who have really studied and done their homework. This is, not, this is not the assessment of fools. And there's this foolishness that has infected the body of Christ, which is causing the body of Christ to suffer from I believe, a demonic uh, paralysis, uh, embracing a fool's mentality, becoming silly, uh, becoming indulgent and frivolous, which all causes to paralyze God's people from their real mission and their real calling in the time of the greatest crisis. I would suggest to you that the people you're allowing 
to entertain you that you think is miraculous are actually uh, detouring you from God's perfect will. You know, transpose where we are now in the United States of America, the gravity of the events that are happening. Do an historical comparison about what's happening, what happened in Nazi Germany. Read history. Get off your posterior. Stop watching some dumb program. Actually read a history book. Look at what was happening when the Nazis took over Germany. And look how it all played out. Know something of history. Compare that dynamic with what's happening here. You'll see a very alarming parallel. Now, if God's people are running around looking for gold dust and and listening to people who who have these, yes, ridiculous visions of heaven that are so silly and they're obviously man-made because the signature is they lack imagination so egregiously then God's people are not going to be able to fulfill what God is calling them to do. That is what a false prophet's job is or a false teacher. And um, you need to be very careful. Um, People don't want to hear it. But if God's people are put into a state of consciousness, which is um, one of complete silliness, irrelevance, you know, when you're, when you're believing things and seeing things, I'm not embarrassed if God works a genuine miracle. I'm not embarrassed to see a move of God. I don't care what the world thinks. But when I see egregious idiocy and foolishness done under the name of the supernatural power of God, what that does is it, is it causes the people in the world to look at Christians like they're a bunch of fools and idiots. And, it, and what it does is it paralyzes the effectiveness of Jesus Christ. That is not what a real prophet or a real teacher does. And so I, I want to issue this as a very strong warning. I'm not even speaking even remotely as strongly as I feel, but I'm very concerned about it. All right, we're going to be back in a moment. You can go to paulmcguire.us. By the way, It's important at this juncture in the program to remind you about the level and intensity of the spiritual warfare that's going on all around us. Um, It's a fact that Wicca and witchcraft, they are the fastest growing religion in America right now. That means teenagers and young adults and so on and so forth, by the millions, are learning how to cast spells. They're involved in witchcraft rituals and uh, the calling on demons and all kinds of things. They're entering very serious spiritual darkness. So the fastest growing religion in America right now is witchcraft. Tied for witchcraft as the fastest growing religion is atheism. That means the complete rejection of all religions, including the complete rejection of Jesus Christ. And then finally, the sobering statistic, which says 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes completely reject their faith in Jesus Christ by the time they enter college. Now, I want to just present those facts to you as evidence of where we are in the spiritual battle. I want to present those facts to you in the sobriety which should be shaping your heart if you are a reader of the Word of God, if you are a follower of fanciful tales, if you are a follower of of false prophecies and false teachers, your heart will not have a genuine burden for the lost because you're filled with nonsense. You're filled with silliness. It's important to understand precisely where we are in history. And right now, I I can say an overwhelming case can be made based on science, on history, sociology, theology, the Bible, Bible prophecy, and many, many other trends that right now in human history, we are in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. And this battle is raging all around us. This battle is so, is so dangerous. And the thing that is most dangerous about this battle 
is that the overwhelming majority of Christians have no idea that this battle is currently going on. The overwhelming majority of Christians don't even, they're not even conscious of the fact that we're in, a, in the greatest spiritual battle. They're oblivious to the reality of it, and they're walking around like they're in a trance state, and they have no awareness of the gravity of the situation. You can say all you want to defend gold dust or whatever else you want to defend. You have no defense for it. This is worse than the response of the German Christians and the Jews in Nazi Germany. They were so deceived. They were so empty of the word of God. They had none of the Holy Spirit in them. So the German evangelical Christians actually voted Adolf Hitler into power. And the Jews were in such spiritual deception that they repeated over and over again, it can't happen here. And by that they meant the fact that millions of Jews were being gassed to death and killed in the Holocaust and the concentration camps. They could not bring themselves to believe it, even when they were standing hundreds of feet from the doors of the gas chambers. They could not believe the truth that the Nazis were going to kill them. So you have, two, you have two large groups of people who had in them the power to stop Adolf Hitler, but both of these large groups of people were paralyzed. The evangelical Christians were paralyzed by the same thing that's paralyzing evangelical Christians today. They were paralyzed because they allowed themselves and their minds to be indoctrinated by what is called the Frankfurt School uh, of German theological higher criticism, in which the Frankfurt School Marxists, who set up the Frankfurt School in the 1920s, they opened these giant seminaries called the German Schools of Theological Higher Criticism, and all the pastors, the denominational heads, and the Christians and Christian leaders attended these theological schools, which were nothing more than indoctrination centers into humanism. And when these so-called pastors and Christians graduated from the Frankfurt School of German Theological Higher Criticism, they no longer had a biblical faith. They no longer believed in miracles. They no longer believed in the virgin birth. They didn't believe in the second coming. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believed, they, they viewed the Bible as just a nice, comforting fairy tale or a mythology to live by. Now, now in, in terms of spiritual warfare terms, that means what they allowed themselves to be exposed to in their thought life literally paralyzed them and neutered them from having any real spiritual paddle, uh, real spiritual power to engage the enormous, horrific principalities and powers and demonic forces that were gathering all over Germany. Let's remember, by contrast, that Germany, while the German schools of theological higher criticism were were ripping the shreds of faith out of people's minds. At the same time, Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich was an occult party. All the highest ranking generals in Nazi Germany and the Nazi party were members of secret occult societies. The Germans, his highest ranking generals and scientists and so on and so forth, they were all deeply devout, faith-filled Satanists, occultists, and members of secret German occult societies. They believed in real supernatural demonic force, and they knew how to harness it and release it in Germany. Demonic forces like the Vril Force, and uh, the Vril Force uh, came through the Vril Society, and the technology for UFOs, etc., was created by the Vril Maidens, who were clairvoyants and channelers. You see, on one hand, we have the Christians going to sleep, and on one hand, we have the Christians being indoctrinated to reject all supernatural power in their faith, and that we have Christians so deeply indoctrinated by the Frankfurt School that they, they view their biblical Christianity as a bunch of myths and fairy tales to live by. Simultaneously, we have the all-out effort by satanic secret societies 
by occult German societies like the Skull and Bones, like Vril, like Thule, with a hardcore occult symbols, symbols like swastikas and, and uh, Skull and Bones belt buckles and demonic sacrifices. They believed in and were harnessing the actual demonic supernatural power of the devil, and they were calling it down upon Germany and the other nations in Europe. Because they believed, the Nazis believed in supernatural power, satanic supernatural power. Whereas Christians were indoctrinated into believing that God didn't exist, and if he did exist, he certainly didn't have any power. Okay. This exact same precise historical uh, trend is happening right now in America. We are seeing a, a, a precise duplication of what happened in Germany happening in America. This is what's happening. The seminaries in America, the mega churches in America, many of the large churches in America, many of the pastors in America, many of the television ministers in America, no longer believe and teach the supernatural power of the Word of God. Instead, they're teaching humanistic, psychological, motivational theories. And worse than that, and I prove it with documentation and facts, I'm not just shooting off my mouth. I have everything that I've just talked about, I have documentation and proof for in my brand new book, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. I quote extensively first-hand documentation of what I'm saying. The, the Frankfurt School, they were the Marxist professors that used indoctrination to destroy the faith of evangelical Christians in Germany. As such, the German Christians had no spiritual power no spiritual discernment to confront the demonic powers. They couldn't even recognize the demonic powers. They had no spiritual power to confront the demonic powers that were taking over Germany. Meanwhile, Hitler and the occult parties are revving up their demonic supernatural power and actually using it. The same thing is happening right now as we speak in America. I talk all about this in very simple English in my book, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. Let me explain it to you, even though I have it in much more important detail. Right now, the, 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 there's something very, something you should lock in on, and that is that the fastest growing religion in America is Wicca or witchcraft. That means there is a massive hunger for young people, and by the way, the number one demographic group that are becoming witches and getting into witchcraft are people that used to be born-again Christians. Now, they're getting involved in witchcraft because witchcraft offers them the supernatural power to change their world, which the church is supposed to do, but it's preaching humanistic unbelief. So their witchcraft is teaching them that if you worship the dark forces, if you perform witchcraft rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices, you can cast spells, you can harness supernatural power, you can get psych psychic power. You don't have to be a victim. You can control your environment, your world, and your life with real supernatural power. There are things you can do not to be a victim, and you can harness and utilize supernatural power if you practice Wicca and witchcraft or get into Satanism or something like that. That's what the promise is. So obviously you've got mil hundreds of millions of young people. What are they going to do? Stick with a dead Christian religion, which has long ago rejected preaching and teaching the authentic supernatural power of God and is now fully reliant on humanistic, atheistic, psychological principles as a counterfeit for the supernatural power of God? They're not interested in a counterfeit of the supernatural power of God. They would rather experience the demonic supernatural power of God than humanism. That's what's happening. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. So all the Christians had no Holy Spirit, had no discernment. They pray nothing would happen. They were empty spiritually because they were relying on humanistic principles.
The Christians in Germany were relying on humanistic principles, just like the Christians in America are relying primarily on humanistic principles. They're empty. The people are flocking to witchcraft, satanic societies, and the occult because they want real supernatural power. That's what happened in Germany. While the Christians were denying the supernatural power of God, the Nazis were embracing, embracing and utilizing and downloading satanic power, witchcraft power, and occult power. The same thing is happening here. But you have to understand it. You have to know the names. You have to be able to put the dots together in the puzzle piece to, to, to make it very vivid and clear for you. I have done that for you. I've spent 40 years researching what I'm talking about. More importantly, I spent 15, 18 years of my life personally involved in the New Age movement, in the occult, experiencing firsthand supernatural things like altered states of consciousness and meditation and astral projection and seeing the great white light. I've experienced the supernatural firsthand, okay? I know all about it, but I also know the firsthand power of God. And so I'm, I've written this book to wake up Christians and to wake up ordinary people. This is just one of the great spiritual battles for America. There are many more that I talk about in the book, like the selling of socialism. Socialism is a destroyer. Scientific mind control, which is connected to ancient sorcery and witchcraft, by the way. MK Ultra, which is totally connected to witchcraft. I talk all about these things. You, you know what? You can't be like, like paralyzed yourself. You can't be neutral. You can't kind of like have a few little crumbs of truth. You've got to be up to speed. I urge you to become up to speed and get yourself a copy of my brand new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. If you order the book now and pre-order it, that means you're pre-ordering it before it's printed. If you pre-order the book now at paulmcguire.us, you get your copy rushed to you before it's released to the general public. You get a financial discount on your copy of the book, and you get an autographed, autographed copy of The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. All you have to do is visit paulmcguire.us and pre-order it now to get all those discounts and, and free extras. Take advantage of it, because the price of the book is going to go up um, significantly by the time it re reaches the general public. Why? It's because I'm in the final, final pages of the book, and I'm making the decision that I'm not going to cut pages, which means the cost is going to go up. And for those of you that are buying it now while the window is still open for the special discount, you get yours. Even if, even if I add the pages that I believe I'm going to add, you're not going to pay a penny more for the book. You're locked in at a special discount price if you get it now at paulmcguire.us. It's not a joke. What I've studied, what I've, what I've lived with for the last year, I have locked myself in the studio like a hermit. Talk to people who know me. I do not answer phone calls. It's rather, you know, tragic. I don't answer phone calls. I have to become like a monk because the, the, the level of concentration to write a book like this, I don't know what, how many pages it's going to be. It's going to be a minimum of 300 pages, maybe more. But for every page, I have 4,000 pages that I'm trimming back. And I, I want to give you the most important stuff. The research is enormous because things keep changing. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit takes over. And this is what the Holy Spirit has imparted to me. The Holy Spirit has given me an incredible supernatural burden for God's people, for young people, about this spiritual battle we're in. I'm telling you, as your brother in Christ, I'm telling you as your friend, that I am deeply, deeply disturbed, deeply concerned, gravely troubled, over this fact, and it is a fact. I know what I'm talking about. I've done my homework. The overwhelming percentage of the Church of Jesus Christ in America is completely asleep. At least 75% of them are completely asleep to the gravity of the danger of the fact that we're in the greatest spiritual battle for the hearts and souls of mankind in the history of the world. 
They're totally asleep. They're totally clueless. And I write about this, by the way, and why they are clueless. It's, it's been done on purpose. But they don't realize they're being set up for a great slaughter. I don't want to scare you. They're being set up for a great slaughter, like lambs to the slaughter. They're being fattened up for a great slaughter. And God's ministers, tragically, because they refuse to read, they refuse to study, they have this, it's pride. They think they know it all. They can't, they don't, they're not teachable. They won't examine the facts. And they're, not, they're leading their people to a slaughter. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to scare you. But, but I'm telling you why this is going to happen. The expression says, those that refuse to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. This whole thing acted itself out in Nazi Germany. It's repeating itself now. The good news is, I don't believe that this is what God wants. I believe God wants to pour out a, a, a biblical great awakening. I believe that God has a plan for America to use America <clears throat> as, a, as a launching pad for a last day soul harvest. I believe God wants to use, I believe God wants to bless America. I believe God wants to keep our freedoms intact. I believe that God wants to prosper America so that we preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, and go into all the world and win souls for Christ and occupy the, the land until he comes. I believe this is God's special prophetic call that began before the foundation of the world. I believe it's a prophetic call that God gave America through the pilgrims and Puritans. I believe that God's hand of destiny is upon America. I believe it with all my heart. <clears throat> I talk about it in The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Souls of Mankind. I talk about it in my book, Trumpocalypse. I talk about it in the book, The Babylon Code. I talk about it in the book. Um, I've written 34 books. I can't remember which books. I talk about it in most of the books. And you should get them, because I did, I, I, I'm not just repeating myself. Conquering the Matrix, A Prophecy of the Future of America. I believe with all my heart that God has a supernatural call on America and a supernatural call on your life. But this is the most important part. Don't think for a minute that God's people can goof off, hit the snooze button, be disobedient, go out there in la-la land, somehow convince themselves that they could walk around and, and, and like the three monkeys, see no evil, speak no evil, and whatever the other one did, hear no evil. Don't think that God's people can be asleep at the wheel, do nothing, be rebellious, and then they can expect to reap a spiritual and material harvest. God doesn't work like that. If, if, if we're going to choose in America as Christians to sow the wind, we're going to re reap the whirlwind. The book that I've written, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Souls for Mankind in the History of the World, is not a doom and gloom book. It is a strong book. You're going to get hit by a lightning bolt, okay? But it's designed to wake you up. Why? Because I believe with all my heart that this is a winnable war, that we can turn things around, but unless we spread the truth of God's Word, and the kind of issues that I'm talking about as fast as we possibly can, and unless God's people repent and start going to churches that are being faithful to the Word of God, um, then guess what? God's, God's put the ball in our court. We can be victorious, we can be overcomers, or we can move into totalitarian socialist state. Now, Every ounce of my being, every, every part of me is saying, Paul, I'm going to do everything in my power with the power of the Holy Spirit not to let that happen. But I need your help. It's really that simple. In the military, they use a term called a force multiplier effect. When God's people gather together with a common thought, purpose, and goal, it has a synergistic energy effect, a force multiplier effect, where a handful of people can can accomplish goals and win victories that are way beyond what they should be able to do. I believe that with all my heart. So I'm asking you to join me. We have a Paradise Mountain Church meeting coming up tomorrow, um, June 26, 2019. You should be there at 6 p.m. Where, where else are you going to be? Watching TV? I mean, be honest. If there's some place that you have to go that's important, I got it. But many of you are going to sit there watching some dumb TV program. Be honest. I mean, just be honest. Not, you don't have to tell me. 
Just be honest to God. Meeting's free. Parking's free. Just register at volmaguire.us. I hope to see you there. We're going to pray for America. We're going to talk about the truth from God's Word. You will come in, and you will come out a different person. Yeah, you will, because you're going to be exposed to the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just that simple. So, I believe that you and I are called for such a time as this. And once again, we are in the spiritual battle of enormous proportions. So I thank God for every one of you that have chosen to be spiritual prayer warriors for me, the ministry, and my family. Thank God for you. Um, Your prayers mean more to me than you know, and your encouraging notes. I thank those of you that are diligent about spreading these programs, the video, the audio, and everything, far and wide, because that's the only way we can beat censorship. And, And don't do it just for my ministry and me. Do it for the other ministries that you believe in, because they're under attack through censorship. It's vicious. They can't play fair, so they're trying to fight dirty. And then finally, remember, spiritual war requires finances. And, you know, I was, I don't make a habit of reading about the Church of Scientology, even though I know a lot about it. But they are using social media, and they are ramping up. And let's just put it this way. The Church of Scientology, which has billions of dollars, by the way, is ramping up after they've been attacked, belittled, ridiculed. You got to give them credit. They don't, they don't stop. Um, they, are, they are going into this, like, the Church of Scientology is like reinventing itself and going into this hyper-evangelism mode, where they're, they're, they're essentially evangelizing for the gospel of L. Ron Hubbard and Dianetics. But they are sophisticated. They're, they're not a bunch of uh, clowns. They're sophisticated. That's what we're competing with, people who are highly sophisticated. And then after I read all the evangelistic material of the Church and Scientology, what spills out on my social media must have been 20 pages of witches, witchcraft, pagans, all uh, selling points, all they're evangelizing. The witchcraft community, the pagans, the Wiccans, they're evangelizing, and they're bringing people in to be witches and Wiccans. So we either enter the mainstream and fight the spiritual battle, or we're going to lose this nation. They have every right to do what they're doing. We need to do it better. That costs bucks. That costs money. So I'm going to thank God for every one of you who go to the Lord, and you don't have your minds made up. You use your minds, but you say, Jesus, how can I help Paul McGuire? and Paradise Mountain Church Ministries. How much do you want me to give? And then you you wait to hear from the Lord, and whatever the Lord tells you, you don't invent hearing from the Lord. You wait till he speaks to you. And no matter how big or out of the box is it, you obey him there. Or if he just tells you, continue what you're doing, be faithful every month, then the Lord will bless you. Because the key is, if everybody obeys the Lord, we are equipped financially to, to do what God has called us to do. And lots of faithful givers giving small gifts, that all adds up. But it's also important to have those people who have been really blessed by God uh, give the bigger gifts they can. It's a combination of both type of giving <clears throat> that enables us to do what we're doing. So I thank you in advance for your faithfulness. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. You can donate online. You can donate via the mailing address there. Look, let's not sit back in the back seat of the car and allow uh, counterfeit religions and everything else to take over our nation. Let's, let's act like the people of God and the supernatural resources that God has given us. And together, let's close today's program with this. Let's offer the Lord a good report like Joshua, Caleb. So let's just say to the Lord, Lord, we are well able to take the land. And that means we will take the land. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. 